sing. I can't sing that song. I get choked up all the time. It's too beautiful. How about you? Um, okay, we are in John chapter 12, verse 20 at 36. And uh, let me start by asking everyone a question. Are you looking for a vision or a direction in life? Have you ever wanted to meet somebody important uh, whom you respected? And not just to sh shake hands with them or get their autograph, but to actually sit down and talk with them and ask them things, maybe even get life-changing advice from them. And if you were, let's say, a young environmentalist, you might want to talk with Greta Thunberg, you know, when she was here in Montreal a little while ago. Uh, you, uh, if you were uh, into sports, if you're a teen who's into, into sports, you're going to want to talk to a great athlete, like a LeBron James or something. And uh, if you're a man looking to find out some structure in your life, you might want to go and talk with Jordan Peterson, right? And if you have a spirit of entrepreneurship, you're thinking, I want to sit down for an hour with Elon Musk, right? Uh, people often hope to meet someone who can impart some piece of wisdom they feel they might be looking for and set them on the right path. Um, I'm not, of course, endorsing any of those people I mentioned, but they are people that, are, that bring out this idea of, of a certain wisdom that people look for. Uh, decades ago, I actually went to, uh, to see a Christian speaker who I really respected and listened to what he had to say, and after it was over, I asked him for a book recommendation, and he chose to give me a book that was 600 pages long, which I read. And truth be told, it had a tremendous impact on my life. You can ask him about that later. Um, now, in this passage, we have some people, Greeks, who want to see somebody. And who do they want to see? That famous quote, we want to see Jesus. Now, they picked a very interesting time to go and see Jesus. And the last we saw last week, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, with a crowd. You know, the, the, the city was packed solid with people coming for the Passover. And uh, he rode in like a king. And people were shouting his name and they were strewing uh, palm branches on the, on the road in front of them. And the religious leaders who were trying to discredit him and block him and stop him in every way they could, um, you know, they, they, they were at their wit's end. And they make this statement in verse 19 where they say, the whole world is going over to him. You know, they're, they're, and these factions among these leaders who want to hang on to power at all costs, even though they're religious leaders, uh, they get together to try and get rid of Jesus and in fact to kill him. Um, his disciples have just been before talking among themselves about who's going to be number two in the kingdom. Right, so they're looking at Jesus to bring about something amazing. He's going to end history finally and bring heaven down to earth. Um, so these are some of the players. The crowd is there too. The crowd wants him, of course. Uh, one thing they've been looking for for a long time is they want a Messiah who's going to get rid of the Romans and restore their nation. Right, so they're looking to Jesus and thinking he's going to be the one to do it. And finally, you have the Romans. Right? The Romans, who are always scratching their heads, wondering, I don't understand these Jews, what are they about? They have no idea what's ever going on. But they got the biggest, baddest army around. Right? And they're there in Jerusalem trying to keep the peace. And if you remember, and the people who read this remember in recent memory, that there had been a massacre of worshippers at a Passover very recently before this. So that's the kind of stew that's cooking in Jerusalem at this time as the Greeks come to see Jesus. Right? There's threats of violence all over the place. You know, senses are heightened. You know, it's, everything seems to be just a heartbeat away from real trouble happening or something fantastic. So these Greeks see Jesus as kind of the man of the hour and that the momentum is all on his side. Right? They see that you know, this man is a prophet who raised a man from the dead just two miles away from there. Right? So this is why, you know, to them, they've heard so much about Jesus and his name is on everybody's lips. Everybody's talking about Jesus in town. Right? Yet in a week, they're probably going to be witnesses to Jesus hanging on a cross between two thieves. But for now, 
They want to see Jesus. Do you want to see Jesus? What would you say to Jesus? Maybe more importantly, what would Jesus say to you? There would be a lot riding on what Jesus said to you. If he is who he says he is, there is no higher authority in existence. Right? You're talking to the creator, the perfect one, who is never wrong. Right? He knows everything about you. And he could say just about anything to you. Right? So that's both a comforting thought and kind of a frightening one as well. Right? Because what he says could save you and be the answer to all your hopes. And if it's not what you want to hear, you could go away in utter despair. Another alternative, of course, is just to ignore him and go about your business. And in this little passage we're going to look at today, all of those possibilities are going to be talked about. So first of all, who are these Greeks? Why do they get a mention? It's strange. They show up and uh, they say they want to talk to Philip. And they, they Philip says to Andrew. And Andrew goes with them to Jesus. They're Greeks. They're probably from up north where there's a big Greek colony right next to where Philip and Andrew lived. Right? So they have Greek names. So they're coming over and they're saying, we want to talk to Jesus. And, um, well, who, you know, who are these Greeks exactly? They're not Jews, clearly, because it mentions that they're Greeks. They're not even Jewish converts. Right? They're heading to Jerusalem to worship, though, at the Passover in the temple. So you're saying to yourself, I thought only Jews did that. <laughs> but these people are what are called God-fearers. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. And you meet people like them in the Gospels a few times, and in the rest of the New Testament, you're going to run, particularly in the book of Acts, you're going to run into God-fearers all over the place. And they appear in secular histories of the time, too. These people, it's like it's a whole bunch of them. And uh, what they are is, they are people who are not Jews, but they really like the God of the Jews. Right? So they, um, they're looking at their own cultural deities, you know, the Zeuses and the Apollos and everything else, and saying, I want none of that. Right? They study the Torah. They're actually reading the Bible, these guys. Um, and they're worshiping the one God of Israel, but they don't want to become Jews. They don't want to dress like Jews. They don't want to get circumcised or follow the Mosaic, well, not the Mosaic laws, but the many laws that sort of came out later in rabbinic Judaism, you know, like the millions of little detailed laws. They don't want to follow those. So they're kind of tolerated by people. At the same time, people are suspicious of them because they have a foot in both camps. Like, whose, whose side are you on here? Um, now, one of them is mentioned earlier in the Gospels, who interacts with Jesus, and Jesus says about him, I tell you, even, not even in Israel have I sound, found such faith. So some of these god fearers you know, really are in the right place. But why are they mentioned here? Well, in verse 19, the Jewish leaders in there, I and mean, we sort of read this a little bit already, in their rage at, at the, seeing Jesus you know, coming in in this triumphal entry, they say, look how the whole world has gone after him. So what's the next thing John talks about? Here's some non-Jews. Right? Here are people. You know, this is Jesus' message is not just for the Jews of Jerusalem and that country, but for the whole world. Right? It's for everybody. These Greeks are Gentiles. They're foreigners. They're strangers. They're outsiders. You know, if you were raised in Israel and you were Jewish, you're like, these guys are not me. Right? And here John is saying, look, these guys too want to come and see Jesus. Right? This passage doesn't end, though, as many others do that we've looked at throughout the book of John. Oftentimes, when you see someone interacting with Jesus, at the end it'll say, many of those listening believed, or something like that. You see that in a few places. Uh, sometimes even the religious leaders, some of them believe. But in this case, in fact, in verse 37, which is just outside of our text, it says that even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their present, they still would not believe in him. Now that passage is kind of talking about not just the Greeks, but the whole crowd. But there's no indication that this interview ended particularly well. In fact, the opposite seems to have taken place. So what went wrong? 
these guys wanted to see Jesus, and I guess Jesus said something they didn't like. Right? But before we deal with their reaction, let's find out exactly what Jesus said in the first place, what he actually said. Now, out of curiosity, when you read that passage, verses 23 to 26, Jesus' answer to them, do you like what he said? It causes some disquiet sometimes as we look at that passage and it's like, what did you, Jesus, what exactly are you asking of us? You know, so these guys are brought before Jesus you know, and he straight away sort of erupts into what seems to be this grand speech that's not even about them. Right? What they have to say is not even recorded. It just says Jesus replied. <laughs> so they're talking with him and Jesus starts this discourse right off. Now, is it possible that Jesus had already moved on to bigger things before they got in the word edgewise? Were they not important enough because they were, they were Greeks? That does not seem likely at all, considering what we have seen, how Jesus spoke to the mighty, the lowly, to one person, to a crowd of people, um, the righteous, the sinner, the sick, the well. He's talked to everybody. And something interesting, he always gives a hearing to them. He always is willing to talk and engage with people very directly. And I think that's why crowds came to talk with him and see him, so he could get no rest. They were just constantly talking with him. You know? um, so they, in fact, want to see Jesus, and guess what? Jesus wants to see them. Let's go home and write that on our walls in crayons. <laughs> Jesus wants to see you is something we should remember. Because he certainly brought them in, right? And after all, wasn't that Jesus' ministry? You know, right at the start of his ministry, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. His goal, Jesus, is to draw all people to himself. And you can see that in verse 32, where he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He's drawing people. When you're praying, just a little aside here, when you're praying because you're hurting, or you're praising God because of something going on in your life, Jesus is not looking at his watch and wondering when you're going to shut up so he can get to do something interesting. We have to banish those kind of thoughts. The idea that God might not want to hear what we have to say. But here, you have what seems to be a very abrupt answer to these guys' visit. You know, they say, we want to see Jesus, and boom, this discourse, come, this discourse comes out. Right? So, we have to remember something. Um, John isn't recording every single word that is said in this conversation. It doesn't start with, you know, Andrew saying, this is Janet and Rick, and this is Jesus, and Jesus saying, hi, Janet, <laughs> how are you? It's just not recorded, right? It cuts right to the heart of the discussion. Right? This is not Jesus blowing them off in any way and telling them, I don't want to hear you. In fact, he does want to hear them, and he does have something to tell them, right? So, John is doing his best to tell you the most important part of this discussion. And what he says in this short little section actually reveals a lot about why this interview doesn't end as many others in the Bible do. Right? And there's a lot of them in the Bible you'll read where you know, Jesus talks to somebody or it's in the Old Testament where someone is, is, is talking with someone and there's just this heart-melting moment you know, where that person finally turns to God and away from their life of sin. And, it's, and there's this reconciliation, and it's so beautiful, and it's often so surprising and, and so satisfying to, the, to us as readers when we look at it. And it's just, this is so great. This doesn't happen here. Right? So what does Jesus say to them, and how does it end up in this way? Well, it says in verse 23, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We want to see Jesus? His answer is, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So where is this coming from? Well, the key might be right there in the word glorified. Right? 
The hour has come for him to be glorified. Remember back in his first miracle in John, which we, we did here, where Jesus' mother was worried that if Jesus didn't do anything, this wedding is going to be ruined. <laughs> which is one of the strangest passages. But uh, Jesus does do something. Right? But what he says to her is, my hour has not yet come. Right? He wanted people to keep things quiet about him at that time. But now... It is his hour, isn't it? He says it's his hour. He just rode into town in this gigantic parade. That's not someone keeping things quiet, right? Like, well, like one of the kings of Israel, you know, people are sh shouting, Hosanna, deliver us now. It must have been quite a moment. You know, they're hanging on his every word, even these Greeks. You know, yes, Jesus, now is the time for you to be glorified. We want to see you glorified. We want to see Jesus. What's going to happen? Do you think that Jesus and the crowd have the same idea what it means to be glorified? Well, they don't, it seems. Glory to people means the same thing it does to us right now. Right? Glory, when we talk about it, is power and success. Thrones, millions of followers on various apps. No carpenter from small town Canada is going to receive glory in this world. And that's what Jesus was back there, right? But Jesus' view of what it means to be glorified is actually far greater than what they expected, right? And, but it's very, very, very different to what they expect. And here's where he starts it. He says in verse 24, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, looking at verse 40, 33 as we're coming up, it's clear he's talking about himself, right? And how he's going to be glorified at his crucifixion and resurrection. And he's foreshadowing. He's telling you this, and he's going to say it in a, few, in a few minutes on top of that. Until this moment when his time to be glorified has come, he is just the seed, right? Sort of holding back all the power and the majesty that's inside there, right? You can't see that stuff in the seed, but it's there. A giant tree that produces fruit, right, where birds and animals have their home, was once a little seed before becoming any of those things. Right? And in fact, for a seed, if it doesn't die, it can never fulfill its purpose. So far, Jesus has healed bodies and pointed people towards their Lord, but something bigger, bigger than anything else, is about to happen. Right? First, he has to die. Now, Passover, where everybody's coming to the Passover here, this festival that's once a year in, in, in Jerusalem, is all about a sacrifice for the people that takes away their sin and takes away their well-deserved punishment and puts it on something else, right? Sin destroys souls and it destroys the world. And he's about to do something that will save mankind forever by going to the cross in our place, which we're going to talk about. That's the glory he's talking about, right? Him, murdered like a criminal, hanging there for all to see. And what does the world say? That's not glory. That's not glory. That cannot be glory. Right? But there's something interesting. You remember at the crucifixion right there, there was somebody who did see the glory a little bit. Right? And if you remember at the crucifixion, it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, who's a Roman military officer, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. Now, who is this centurion? He's Jesus' executioner. He's in charge of putting Jesus to death. His men were shooting dice for his garments right before that, and mocking him, right? And these guys are pros, okay? They've nailed up plenty of guys. And the centurion's seen it all. But this hardened drill sergeant, 
This centurion who held the power of life and death over so many people, who served the glory of Rome, and that's what Roman soldiers believed they were doing, looked up at a dead man and praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. That's Jesus being glorified. The centurion heard Jesus ask his father to forgive his executioners, admonish the crowd and encourage them to repent, even when he was the one being punished, to show love and mercy even to the thief beside him who was also dying. That's being glorified by people. That's Jesus receiving glory from people. But his father will glorify him in a verse or two, as we'll see. But people don't like saviors on crosses. They don't like a suffering Messiah. They want a Messiah who can give them what they want now. And what's worse, they don't want a Messiah who says, you have to die too. Right? Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So Jesus wants me to hate my life, and basically to die as well. Yes. Do you want to hear that message? If you love your life, you're doomed. But hate it, and you will live. Now, what could Jesus possibly mean by this? Does the Lord of life himself want you to hate life and everything in it? The seed that is about to produce abundant fruit forever is telling you you have to hate life, hate your life. And you notice how the gospel talks so much about life and fruitfulness together. There's so much of that, you know? Cast your burdens on me. You know, I take on my yoke. We will produce great things. There's always this idea of life and expanding life. Is this the same Lord who said that if you follow, you'll produce a crop in life, 160 or 30 times what has been sown? The one who John says in chapter 1, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Yes, this Jesus is saying you must hate your life to become my follower and to be with him. These Greeks and the crowds are heading to worship right? in the Passover, aren't they? Yet Jesus is saying they have to repent and turn away not just from the sin in their life, but everything in their life. The things that make them what they are, they have to turn away from it. What exactly is wrong with life? Right? Jesus seems to be very unfair here saying you need to drop everything and follow me. But remember that time in the Gospels as an example, in case you're worried at the moment, as we all should be sometimes, but you remember that time in the Gospels where a young man who's very wealthy comes to Jesus and says, in their conversation, he says, I've kept all the commandments, I've done it all, Jesus. What do I need to do to get eternal life? And Jesus tells him, sell everything and you'll have treasures in heaven. And so the man walks away sad. Jesus saw that in the end, this man didn't want what God wanted for him, but what he wanted from God. Right? His life was not about faith, but about the position he held in the world. And I'll give you an example from, from some of the things I've seen in my own life of people who you think, well, this person's a churchgoer, this person's this, or this person's that, what's, what's the problem? I spoke to a person where I used to work who told me they attended church every single week, as far as they can remember, but they'd be leaving their local church. And I asked why, and they said, because lately too many poor people have been showing up. You know, and we kind of had this affluent vibe going, and it was really good, and these guys said, I'm, I'm done with that, right? So when the nature of the place changed, she was gone. Another person I, I worked with attended a Bible study I gave at the office and uh, was surprised at what the Bible had to say after attending a few sessions. And she told me she was an elder in the church she attended, but had never opened the Bible once 
or read a single verse. One of the saddest things I ever experienced in my time as a teacher occurred years ago while I was one of the leaders of a Bible study here in town um, that was composed almost exclusively of non-churchgoers. It was young people in their 20s. Um, one girl came because her friend invited her, and after being there a few weeks, she found out she loved Jesus. We were going through the Gospels, and what's not to love? And at one time, I, was, I remember specifically, I was talking about something about Jesus, and she just suddenly reached over and picked up a Bible and held it, and crushed it, and held it, and held it. You know, it was like this was everything to her. And she kept attending with great enthusiasm for, for a while, quite a while. And weeks later, she asked me the question, what do I think about reincarnation, and does it fit in with the Bible? And I said, I don't believe in reincarnation. I don't think it fits in the Bible. And I explained why I think that what Christ is offering is so far superior to that. This crushed her, and she never came back to that Bible study. It turns out she loved Jesus as long as he said what she wanted to hear. And far from hating this life, she wanted this life to go on endlessly. Please remember her in your prayers. Why do people reject Christ? I think it's because they expect Christ to fix things in their life, but not to fix them. People complain endlessly about their lives, knowing that everything is bent and broken, but they still want to be captain of that sinking ship. From Jeremiah chapter two, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. People's sin pollutes everything in their lives and the lives of people around them, but they want to hang on to that sin while, of course, hating the sin of others. But God says people are broken cisterns. It's like something that catches water underground, you know, holds on to vast amounts of water. But he says you're cracked and broken, you can't hold water. So pouring more water in, which is the solution of the world, is never going to work. More of the same is never, ever going to be the solution. Right? People are living in an unreal fantasy that somehow they'll use the system to beat the system. That is the life Jesus says you must hate if you're going to follow him. He says, hate that life and follow me. My glory is real because it does something. It produces fruit that's eternal, filling you with joy. And it looks like these Greeks wanted to see Jesus to find out if he can fulfill their vision of the Messiah. But Jesus shattered that by telling them they had to give up on following themselves. How much does Jesus want to save these Greeks and the crowd? And how much does he want them to start living a life that will be an eternal life with him? Look at verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. For, for this very reason I came to this hour. Jesus is troubled in mind because he knows what he's about to face. Right? And it's real to him. It's just as real as it would be to you and I. Right? Just as he was troubled at the tears he saw at Lazarus' funeral, that when he saw these people crying, he himself wept and wept deeply along with them so that they could say, look how he loved him. They could be amazed by his love. Right? He came to die to face death. And from Hebrews 12, talking about Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus did not come to teach us all kinds of good lessons about wisdom. He came so that he could save sinners, and that was only possible through the cross. Doing that would glorify his Father. How does that glorify God? Right? 
He shows the Father is a righteous judge. Not just a judge, a righteous judge who will not tolerate sin because he hates it. Yet he loves us so much that rather than punish us, he takes the penalty of sin on himself. Christ, the only sinless one, the only innocent, takes on the shame and the sin of all of us. So it's paid for. It's not forgotten. You don't just laugh off sin. You don't laugh off the terror of 10,000 years of human history. It was paid for. Verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So here you have Jesus calling on the Father right there in that spot to show a glimpse of his glory. Show us your glory, Father. Why? To prove what he has been saying is true. Right? And of course he does. The Father says that in this voice from heaven. And you know, interestingly, John records two reactions. Uh, what are the reactions? Yes, God is glorified. No, he is not. Some people said it was just thunder. Other people said it was an angel. Right? And it says in verse 37, no matter what signs he showed, there were those people who would not believe because the cost of following him was too high. People don't lack evidence to believe. You can say that Jesus is not what he says he is, but what are you going to do in the face of the miracles? Just deny it, I guess. But the voice Jesus said is not for his benefit, but for theirs. In a few days, these people see this seed, this Jesus, die. They'll also see him lifted up. That's what he says in verse 37, in verse uh, 30, 32, I think. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't write it down. <laughs> but they're saying that, Jesus is saying, you will see me lifted up. Right? Jesus means lifted up onto the cross. What are they thinking? Lifted up onto a throne. That's what they want. They want Jesus lifted up on a throne, not on a cross. They ignore what the Old Testament had said. Because it said these guys were, were reading the Torah. These are, these are, these are God-fearers. And the crowd also. They read it. But they skipped over the suffering Messiah and jumped ahead to the final Messiah when Jesus comes back. They didn't want the life Jesus was talking about which they could have if they repented or turned from their sin. They wanted to keep the life and have a Messiah who would keep pouring water into their cracked and broken water jars in hopes that their dreams are going to be fulfilled, their totally earthly and worldly dreams. So he tells them, time is running out. He's not going to be here much longer. And that they're stumbling around in darkness. The whole world is stumbling around in darkness. He says, now is the time to enter the light and become children of light. Right? By putting all of your trust, all of your hopes in the one source of light that there is anywhere. He wants them to put down their weapons, sell their possessions, and believe. He is crucified, it says in verse 32, to draw all people to himself as you see him up there and accept why he is up there. If you're listening to this right now and you don't believe and you love this life, that does nothing to keep you, that no, does nothing good for you except keep you in open rebellion against God and any hope of salvation. Right now, Jesus says, is the time. It's the time to let Jesus transform you into a new creation. At the cross, the power of death and of the evil one has been crushed forever. And your chains, forged in this world, are broken. Religion can never save you. Only God can. Now for the Christians here, you may say, Denny, I still feel like I love life and I'm drawn to sin. Even though down deep I hate it. And you know what I say? Me too. I have the same problem as you. We all do. Now, I can tell you, though, 
that the only reason you are worried about that is because you're walking in the light. If it wasn't for the fact that you were walking in the light, you'd be in darkness to this whole issue. It would not be a problem for you. But here you are saying, I love Christ, and yet still, you know, I, I, I involve myself in such stupid things. You know, I, I'm it's still a sinner at heart. And we have another person who agrees, not just me and you, but Paul, as he writes in Romans chapter 7. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. <laughs> what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. The Holy Spirit has already begun a work in you of sanctification. That's why those things smart when you do them. But we have a Savior who forgives us. We need to be amazed by Jesus. We need to hate that life he was talking about. We need to remember that we are not supposed to remain in hard shells, but die to the old self so we can be fruitful and have a rich and abundant life in Christ alone. Are you dying to live? Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for rescuing us. We're helpless without you every minute of every day, Lord. But you build us up and you cover us with uh, a gown and robes and jewels, Lord, to stand before you that we didn't deserve and we didn't make. Lord, you love us so much, it just seems so impossible, but it's true. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for this congregation, I pray for this city that we can encourage people and talk to them to turn away from this life of destruction and turn to you in a life of abundance that lasts forever. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.